10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Growing Boulder, what's next? Hey, congrats. You were born to be 65. You're good at it. But you weren't born to be an expert on Medicare. But good news, you don't have to be. Growing Boulder has created a simple guide to take the guesswork out of choosing a Florida Blue Medicare Advantage plan. So go ahead, celebrate. Life isn't a destination, but a journey. And Growing Boulder is a great place to start. Brought to you by Growing Boulder and our partners at Florida Blue Medicare. Hi, everybody. I'm Mark Middleton in the Growing Boulder offices. Uh, and I got to tell you, I am very excited to speak to our guest this morning. C.G. Ware is a best-selling historical novelist. She's a network reporter. She is a writer, a lecturer, an on-air host, and an Emmy award-winning television producer. Uh, I mean, let's face it, she's just a cool chick in general. Uh, she's also an expert on right-sizing and not just the stuff uh, but your life. And she's got a great new novel out that she wrote during the pandemic while she was being treated for lymphoma. So uh, I'm excited to catch up with CG. But uh, before we do that, uh, how are you guys doing today? Uh, I mean, that's a loaded question this morning, isn't, uh, isn't it? And, you know, usually I end this program with something that, that's on my mind. But today I'm going to flip the format a bit because uh, you know, I think what's on my mind is on all of our minds this morning. This, uh, I think it goes without saying, has been an extremely difficult year on many fronts. And, you know, let's be honest, it's not over yet. I think we are all frustrated, we're exhausted, uh, we're hurt, uh, and many of us are, are a little bit angry. At Growing Boulder, we make a daily concerted effort to avoid anything that is uh, hyper-political. And that doesn't mean that we won't take a stand on important issues. We believe that we can uh, and that we should talk about gender equality and racial injustice and socioeconomic disparity. And we like to think that we should be able to do it in a way that is apolitical. Uh, but that said, everything these days seems to be hyperpolitical. Uh, we've made what we consider to be you know, the most engaging, uplifting, inspirational posts that are totally apolitical, but yet someone will accuse us of, 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 of inserting politics into something. But, you know, this is what Growing Boulder is about, and we're not going to be dissuaded uh, from our mission uh, by those who only want to divide. Uh, we don't care, honestly, if you are Christian or Jewish or Muslim or Buddhist or atheist. We are all human beings, and we're all trying to make the most of our lives. We don't care if you are black or white or Latino or Asian or Native American. We don't care if you are bi or gay or trans or urban or rural. Uh, I know it, it sounds kind of silly to say, but, but we love you. We love all of you. And our mission is, is very simple. It, it's just to help you be you, be the best version of yourselves, become the very best person you can be. Uh, so here's what I've decided in the last couple of days. And, and honestly, it, it feels like a bit of a cop out to me, but I am going to totally try to disconnect from the daily hyper political drama. Um, because let's face it, I'm not going to run for political office. I'm not going to write a political blog. I'm not going to uh, become a fundraiser for a major uh, political pack. I am going to continue to build our business because we know we're doing good. Uh, we know we're making a difference. We know that our message is more important now than ever. That said, I will privately support candidates that I believe in. Um, and my belief is, is going to be based upon their integrity. It's going to be based upon their decency. It's going to be based upon their honesty. And it's going to be based upon their willingness to consider positions that I'm opposed to. Uh, my belief to be founded uh, in the ability to compromise, the ability to understand that we are all the same. Uh, we're all human beings. We all have different lives. We all have different experiences. And we all have different challenges. So 
whoever wins this election, uh, I'm not going to buy into the hate. I'm not going to buy into the division. I'm not going to buy into the daily stress and the frustration because, I mean, let's face it, it's not healthy. I think we've all you know, aged a lot over the past six months. I mean, we're all exhausted. Everybody I talk to these days says, oh my gosh, I'm stressed, I'm exhausted. Uh, but I will be paying attention and, and I will engage in discussions about big issues, but only in a way uh, that is respectful and only with a willingness to consider. And I mean, really consider others' opinions. Uh, so is that even possible? Can we learn to talk about human issues in a way that isn't political, in a way that is respectful, in a way that is open? Uh, I hope so, uh, because we believe in you. Uh, we believe in your opportunity to make the rest of your life the best of your life. And you know, when you, when you live in an ageist culture, you're being held down. When you live in a sexist culture, you're being held down. When you live in a racist culture, you're being held down. Fighting for what we believe in is, is not just a good thing, it's a great thing. But if we're gonna engage in a fight that actually bears fruit, that actually brings value, that actually creates change, we have to be willing to acknowledge that we all have something to learn. We all have to be willing to try to walk in one another's shoes. Uh, you know, these are deep, honest, admirable concerns on both so sides of this great political divide. So, so how do we move forward as, as a country, uh, irrespective of who might win this election? Well, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take a deep breath. I'm gonna understand that despite all of our problems, all of our divisions, we still live in an amazing country with unlimited potential. And I'm not gonna give up, uh, but I am gonna give in. Uh, I'm gonna give in uh, to looking for similarities uh, instead of magnifying differences. Uh, I don't like automatically eliminating friends because of their political views. I have some friends, or I did, that think entirely opposite of what I do politically, but they are fun, interesting, engaging, inspiring people. Uh, and I don't wanna lose that friendship. I don't wanna lose that connection. Uh, I don't wanna give up on that. You know, there is question a culture of division in this country that is very dangerous. Uh, we need to somehow create a culture of cooperation. That doesn't mean we have to agree on everything. It doesn't mean we have to agree on anything, uh, but we have to understand that we can't change the culture if we don't change the conversation. And for some reason, we have reached a point where many of us cannot even have the conversation. So that said, let's get on with a conversation that I am uh, very excited to talk about. As I mentioned, C.G. Ware is a big time talent. She worked for ABC Radio in Los Angeles for 17 years on TV. She's been an on-air host for PBS and three of uh, the major networks. She's a print journalist whose work has appeared in many national publications. She's a sought after speaker. She's the author of six and, and maybe seven now. We'll find out historical novels. Uh, she's also written a couple of nonfiction books, including one that's called Right Size in Your Life that the Wall Street Journal called one of the best books ever on retirement. So let's get with it as C.G. Ware joins us now from her home in the San Francisco Bay Area. CG, I'm sorry you had to listen to that rant, but uh, welcome. No, I, I needed it. <laughs> <laughs> because I know I have a few friends that I have to build bridges back to, and he, they do too. No, this has been a fraught, fraught period. And I, I, I agree, everyone's just exhausted. So I, as you were saying, take a deep breath. That's what I'm doing. Anyway, it's great to see you. How are you? Are you doing well, I hope. Yeah, yeah we're, we're doing great. Thank you. Um, I, I was about to say surprisingly, but uh, not surprisingly, we've got a great team. We've got an incredible business mission. We are all passionate about moving forward. And, you know, I just feel so blessed, CG, as I know you do, to have, uh, you know, something that we love to do that keeps us engaged where we feel like we're making a difference. And, you know, I do want to talk about all the things you're involved in, but uh, I, I have a picture of you celebrating your birthday this year. Is it okay to share that picture? And, and can I ask you? Yeah, can my, I ask you? My, I haven't had a haircut during the whole COVID. As you can tell, I had shorter hair then. Uh, can I ask how old you turned? I turned 78 
that morning. And I am in front of a wonderful uh, restaurant here in Sausalito called Poggio's. And I've been in a walking group, a dog walking group for about 15 years. And when anybody in the group has a birthday, we go to Poggio's, a trattoria, and at eight o'clock in the morning, and they give us champagne and we have a birthday celebration. So this was mine last May 22nd. Well, no, I guess it was a year ago because it was COVID. We didn't do it this year. But anyway, um, yeah, and it's a wonderful wonderful. Um, we bond with these women and we call ourselves kind of the super agers because we're still walking three miles, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturdays. The dogs come and go, but the, the group of us <laughs> that eat, um, we, we are, we're still walking. Hey, hey, Mikey, let's go back to that picture again, can we? Because, uh, you know, this, this is the new 78. You know, I, I hate it, CG, when somebody says, you know, the 70 is the new 40. This is the new 78. I mean, uh, I, I know you're, you're, you're an expert at presenting something on camera, but, but, but tell me this photo is real. Tell me this photo reflects how you feel about your life in general, because it looks like you're, you're having a great time. Well, we are. I mean, you know, I think that's what's kind of kept us going during this tough, tough year. That photo is a, is an iPhone photo. Somebody snapped. One of my walking pals, um, you know, took it and uh, uh, and sent it to me. So I have it in my in my collection. But it was a joyous day. I mean, it's sort of a shocker to think, gosh, I'm two years away from 80. How can that possibly be? You know, but um the, the attitude that, that I've tried to hold on to and I think really saw me through a lot of the tough times is that this is all we've got and I'm fine today and I'm blessed today and I should be grateful today. And that's what I'm, that's really my attitude. I'm grateful hey. today. I'm still breathing. I'm here, you know, and I'm feeling good. Amen. You know, that, that's, that is really what we're all about is trying to focus on uh, the possibility instead of uh, simply the loss. Uh, and as we've all learned, CG, as we get older, uh, an important skill to have is the ability to adapt and accommodate and continue to move on despite the many challenges. And, you know, as we said earlier, this has been a difficult year for, for all of us. But, you know, you've had the, the extra additional challenge of, of a major uh, health concern. Can you tell us a well, little bit about that? The year before COVID hit, thank okay. goodness. But, you know, you're still under the shadow for a while. Um, this was the weirdest thing. You will not believe the story about, I guess, 18 months ago, two years ago. My son, uh, who's now in L.A., the, the family was um, we always go up in the high Sierras in the mountains in the, uh, during the summertime. So I went up there and I ended up, you know, sleeping on the porch. And that while I was doing that in the middle of the night, I think some big spider came and bit me on the face. And my entire face swelled up. And then when it went down, there was just this one lump on my neck. So we just assumed for like three weeks that it was just the leftover spider bite. Well, that spider bite saved my life. Because when I finally went into the doctor saying, hey, what's this? This thing will not go away. It turned out it was one of the 32 kinds of lymphoma, which is a blood disease, as many of us horribly know about. <clears throat> but of course... Um, I really landed on my feet because of the 32 kinds of lymphoma, there are now, well, at that time there were six, and now there are eight declared curable, not just treatable. So I went plunging into treatment where I had, I, I, and because of the spider, they caught it really early. It was less than stage two large B cell lymphoma. So I'm really lucky. I live near Stanford and in Marin. <clears throat> so I went down there where, by the way, they're one of the great lymphoma centers in the world. And they cooked up a cocktail and a, and a radiation um, routine. And I went back to Marin with all the prescriptions in the cocktail. And I was treated within five minutes of my home. Wow. And uh, this was the last day of radiation. And if you can believe it, you... <laughs> Uh, I had to be under that mask, pinned down at 100 pounds of pressure, while that big machine you see there was circling and circling and circling, zapping the lump that was on my neck, and, and you will appreciate this, avoiding my vocal cords, which could have been silenced by radiation. 
So it was, as they say, a challenge. And uh, I had to have a mouth guard, which I sort of gag about. Anyway, I learned deep breathing. I learned literally to live one second at a time. And this was the incredible team that took care of me. And they were just unbelievable. And so when this whole thing with COVID and the health workers, I cannot tell you how much I love these people. And we need to do everything we can to honor them and help them and pay them and realize what they do. Because it was an amazingly hard, but worthwhile experience. Folks, we're talking with uh, C.G. Ware, who is a, uh, you know, I don't want to say former anything, because I think C.G., anything is still possible for you. I got a new job. I got a new job. <laughs> there you go. You <laughs> used to be uh, a network uh, radio and television reporter for just about everybody. People in the L.A. area, California, know her very, very well. Accomplished author, now a speaker. And, you know, I just wanted to talk to her because I think she really you know, has a great attitude about life in general. And, and even though I got the chronology a little bit wrong about your lymphoma battle, I think this next photo I'm not going to get wrong uh, be, because you continue to stay active and to move. And one of the things you like to do is play, and you have continued to do that. And that has helped you get through the pandemic. Oh my, God. my leg should be higher. It should be way <laughs> higher. Anyway, I, um, I grew up in Hollywood. My dad was a screenwriter and a radio writer and a magazine writer. And we grew up in a very unusual world. And um, I took dancing from the time I was four years old. And I actually danced professionally for about two years out of college. And, um, and then, of course, you know, life goes on. And I took class for a while. 40 years later, you know, um, I started dancing in local shows here in, 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 in my little maritime village uh, across the bridge in San Francisco. And so when COVID hit, I had a friend who said, oh, guess what? The San Francisco Ballet, which is the, our fabulous world-class ballet, the school is going to teach online. They, you know, they're trying to stay alive and they figure if they offer ballet classes, you know, you pay $10 a class, that will help sustain the ballet. So I put a bar in our little guest house there, which is an office and a guest house. And I started taking ballet. And I want you to know this morning after the show, I'm going to get off and go out there. And we do this um, two days a week. Uh, and it has been the savior, you know, that I got back into it and tried to get back in shape as a dancer. And it's just bar work, you know, and it looks simple. I'm telling you. It's not. It's hard. <laughs> and, um, it's been fantastic. And there were 70 people on the call every class. And they're in Paris at four in the morning. They're in Australia right. because everyone loves the San Francisco Ballet. And to be honored, I mean, to have the honor of being taught, you know, by one of the teachers. Some of the classes are taught by the dancers. And it's just been opened up a world that I had kind of closed down for for a long time so that was one of the things that sustained me during covid and i'm on class 54 i think today i've been uh, doing it for months <laughs> not getting that much better but <laughs> you know it, it's a great point cg because you know the technology that we're using now that you use for your ballet class has been around for a while but you know one of the the few silver linings if you will of the pandemic is, is that we have all found ways to either use it differently or use it more frequently and you know i, I think this is going to be something that is going to be a major addition to all of our lives as we continue to age enable uh, enable us to stay connected not just to family and friends but uh people in our classes in paris i mean that's exactly. pretty cool Exactly. You know, I mean, it, 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 people talk about Zoom fatigue, which I'm sure you get sometime, but it's been an extraordinary thing to be able to to connect when you can't connect. And uh, for me, it's been we just had a, a, a local election here. And because somebody had heard that I used to be a TV person asked me to moderate um the the debates and the and the discussions between the candidates. And we did it on Zoom. You know, wow. it was amazing. And I was the traffic cop like you. You know, I was just the moderator saying, it's your turn, it's your turn, you know. Um, but again, we didn't lose the fact that we were having a local election and we wanted to know who's who and what the candidates were. And in a funny way, it kind of brought the candidates closer to the people who were going to vote for them or not. All right, let's talk about your, your writing because I, I think it's really cool. You know, you have obviously multiple, 
balance, but you've continued to develop ones that enable you to still pursue your creative passions and make a living from your home there. And, and I should note, folks, that uh, CG has a degree in history from uh, Harvard University. Not only that, she's the first woman uh, graduate of Harvard College to be president of the Harvard Alumni Association worldwide. So uh, uh, she now writes historical fiction, which, uh, you know, I'm guessing as a news person, uh, someone who understands investigative journalism, all of those skills translated into what you're doing now. Uh, you, you obviously derive a great deal of pleasure in writing historical novels. Tell us about your most recent one. Well, this was such an amazing thing. I, I, you know, I've written, actually, I've written, I think, 12 novels and two nonfiction. So I'm like on number 15, I think, or something. But anyway, a couple of years ago, uh, my husband and his and his father have uh, loved France and gone to France and been part of an educational foundation which raised money to bring American kids over to learn French and all of that. And so we were going to a place called Talois in southern, uh, I mean, in the Alps in France. And um, we would walk by these statues, you know, you never know where we're going to get a story. Some of the sketches, my French is mm, so so, and Tony's is pretty good. So, one time we just sort of stopped and we realized that all these statues were to the resistance in France, the people who fought against the Nazis. And then a French friend of mine took me to a little tiny museum called, it was a uh, called the Resistance, the, the, the museum about the local resistance. And now, as I walked in there, I saw all these pictures of women agents, secret agents, uh, British. And I started following that thread and I ended up discovering that there were about four or five American women who, for various reasons, ended up joining what was called the Special Operations Executives, which was a division of MI6, the famous James Bond. And they were training French speakers to parachute them into France to work with the French resistance to coordinate, to prepare for the big end of the day. By the way, I discovered there was another D-Day 2 that um, uh, landed in the south of France. Well, anyway, I began to try to find out who were these women? What were the women doing? And they were amazing. They took the same training, like boot camp the men did. They had to learn to parachute. They had to learn to silent kill if they had to. So I ended up writing this, this book, which was called Landing by, wait a minute, I guess, Landing by Moonlight. And it really tells the fictional story of one of the women that I got interested in and her story. Uh, and now I'm doing the second one called Above the Clouds. And this was a second American woman who was a crack skier. And she ended up as a courier carrying hand grenades in her backpack up in the Alps in the very area that we have been going to all these years and walking by those statues and not paying any attention. And it turned out that the woman I'm writing about now was the one who blew up the train station uh, next to where we come in from Paris <laughs> every every year. And she was told to blow this um, station up right as the Allies were landing at D-Day so that the Germans couldn't bring in any more material, you know. And, and I had walked by this little plaque, you know. I mean, so it just shows you, you know, you never know where the next story is. So I'm uh, I'm calling this group called the uh, American Spy Sisters series. And it's been uh, just a joy because um, now that we're home with COVID, luckily the one I'm writing now is set in the place that I know very well physically. But the Google machine, whenever I want to know something, <laughs> like, I just go, and, uh, and in fact, the other day I was thinking, did they sleep in the underground? In I had a scene in London, you know, and so I went, uh, London, Blitz, Underground, and up comes this incredible photo. People with nurses on the rails of the subway sleeping during the Blitz. And, wow. you know, so I, I could carry on writing this book uh, despite COVID because fortunately I'd actually been to the area because I can't write about places I haven't seen. And I think that's the old reporter in me. You know, I mean, I actually use those same skills of who, what, where, why, when, and fact check, because in historical novels, if you put something in there that some World War II buff knows you got wrong, <laughs> you hear from them, just like you do when you <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they throw your book across the room and they write you a really nasty letter. <laughs> so I'm doing my best from my little 
Maritime Village Cottage <laughs> to try to get this right. But it's been fun. And, you know, it's been a job. Every day I get up and if I'm a good girl, I sit down and I work and I'm on page 389. So I'm getting there, you know, of the new one. Based upon your description uh, of, of your book, CG, I, I have to imagine you sold the film rights. I mean, this has got Hollywood written all over it. Please. That would be great for my dotage, you know. I mean, in case they have to ship us somewhere to live, you know, um, it does. I must say it has uh, a movie written all over. I think it'd be a great Netflix short series, you know. Amen. And, uh, you know, and because it's the American women and most people don't even know they were involved in, uh, in you know, the secret agent business. And they were incredible because they got away if they spoke good French. You know, if any man walking around in France during World War II, why wasn't he in the army? You know, why wasn't he doing something else? So the men were very suspect, the agents, and they got caught a lot. And the women got away with much more and were very, very effective. And, uh, you know, there's all these things that that's what's so fun about being a reporter. You know, you start in, you don't know hardly anything. And by the end, you learn all these amazing facts. And uh, this woman that she blew up the very train station that I, has been rebuilt <laughs> and that we come into. It was just one of the thrills of my life, you know, to discover that, you know. So that's what makes it fun. And that's what keeps us going. On full display in the person of C.G. Ware right now is the the benefit um, of of curiosity. I mean, it is something that not just keeps us alive, but but keeps a quality of life as we grow older. And, and C.G., I can't let you go without asking you just a little bit about right sizing. You mentioned you wrote two nonfiction books. Uh, right sizing your life uh, was written, I believe, in two thousand and seven. Uh, people right. still refer to it today. Uh, what is right sizing, and and is it still a, a philosophy, a technique, a strategy that you employ? It absolutely is. You know, when I we moved from Los Angeles, we had you know we had one of those big life changes that everybody has, where the dog dies, the kids are out of out of the house, one job ends. You know, you've got to make these decisions. You make a big plan. So we made this boot plan to move back to Northern California and we went from 4,000 square feet eventually to about a thousand. I live in a little cottage, as you can see, a little cluttered cottage. It needs more right than that. <laughs> but when we moved, we had to deal with so much stuff and I did everything wrong. And as I realized, I, you know, we had seven couches and I, I mean, I gave stuff away. I mean, it was stupid. And I realized as a reporter, I said, there's got to be a better way than this. And, and uh, so I began to talk to people about how do you downsize with a difference? How do you downsize so you end up with what you use, what you love, what you need? And what do you do with the other stuff that you've been collecting your entire life? And so that's what the book was about, to end up with simplifying your life, but keeping what matters most to you and making it work in the stage you're in now. You know, what is the age and stage you're in right now that would make things easier? And the hard thing is that, you know, to get rid of stuff seems like a loss. And so a lot of people, I realized it was psychological with me why I had such a hard time. You know, what about my kid's baby rocking chair? You know, he's now 48. He doesn't need it. <laughs> but, you know, you, you work out different ways to, to give meaning to the things you want to keep. And by the way, that rocking chair ended up now is with my son and his two-year-old daughter. But, you know, every decision you make, do you love it? Do you use it? And there's a systematic way to make these decisions that don't rip your heart out. Now you know where Marie Kondo got it all. Um, yeah, yeah, she came uh, after me. I want you to know she's the one who made a fortune. But I feel that I laid down, you know, I laid down. Amen. Yeah. I agree. Hey, uh, last question before I let you go, and I'm going to pretend I'm uh, your, your ABC or CBS producer right now and, and, and kind of give you a time here. Uh, give us a 30 second away uh, a lesson about life uh, is there a moral to your story in general that uh, you know that that you've learned about successful aging that that we could all learn from as well well I think having lymphoma was a big lesson as anybody who's gone through a, a health challenge will tell you but I think I have an attitude that I got from my father which is that life is exciting you need to be grateful for the good things you've got and to stay curious 
and to stay interested and to be interested in what other people are doing and what other people are thinking and what's the new, new thing. And you either like it or you don't, but it's being in the now because now is all we got. It's the old bromide. It's today we've got, I got today. And every day I've, I felt that way before I went through lymphoma and I went through it, you know, uh, with so much help. And I was grateful for everything. My husband was unbelievably wonderful as I knew he would be, but he was. So it's about generosity. It's also curiosity and gratitude. That's my thing. 29, 30, <laughs> you nailed it, CG. Hey, thanks so much. Folks, uh, you, you should follow her. You should pay attention to what she's doing because she's interesting and inspiring. Uh, and you can go to her website to, to find out more about her books, everything that she's got going on. It is cgware.com. And of course, we'll link to it from growingbolder.com as well. Uh, CG, thank you so much. It was uh, a delight talking to you and uh, stay well. Hang in there. You too. I'm fine. By the way, I got a great health report. She said you're cured. So I'm fine. Amen. Take a deep breath, uh, as, as we all will. Yeah. Uh, okay. Our meme today, folks, uh, is one that is, is really kind of a shout out and a thank you to CG, if you will, who has helped us understand that once you need less, you have more. Yeah, and you know, and I truly think that understanding that is one of the greatest gifts of growing older, letting go of the insignificant, the unimportant, to have more time and energy for that which really matters. You guys have a great weekend. Take a deep breath, smile, be kind to one another because it is all good. okay. This is the world we live in. These are the days to come and it is up to us to seize them all. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Ordinary people living extraordinary lives. These are the pages you'll find them on. And this is the magazine. Growing Boulder. In your mailbox, on your screen. Subscribe now at growingbolder.com slash magazine.